Could have been the, the elephants uh, that were used in South Asia, uh, which Alexander the Great encountered. Uh, this is war today. Uh, the elephants have changed. Uh, obviously, they become mechanized. Uh, they have uh, firepower, uh, but the principle is the same. So, now, this is the second, second thing to do uh, is to define what war in Asia. I mean, you know, what is war? I mean, war can include uh, a very limited border conflict, sometimes with no fatalities, just a few soldiers getting injured, or it can include a major conflagration as the Second World War with you know, probably if you include all the fatalities, something like, I assume, 100 million uh, close, or at least 50 million dead. Uh, this is this is probably the these are the warriors of Genghis Khan, uh, probably without any doubt uh, the greatest East Asian warrior of all times, uh, a man who conquered an enormous area of the Eurasian landmass. And uh, so, what I'm defining first, Asia. I'm really talking about East Asia. I'm not talking about South Asia. I'm not talking about uh, West Asia, Southwest Asia. Uh, and I'm talking about Asia, East Asia, particularly Northeast Asia. Um, and I'm also, obviously, in this case, uh, looking at a major conflagration, something that would be a big war. Uh, and therefore, that would essentially entail, at a minimum, a conflict with China on the one hand and, and Japan, the United States, uh, on the other hand. Uh, but there could very well be a other participants, uh, other countries, you know, whether it's India, Vietnam, Russia, South Korea, North Korea, could join, and there would be no geographical limit. In other words, it could spread to the rest of the world, well beyond uh, Northeast Asia, and it would be fought on land, on in the air, at sea, both surface and underwater, uh, in space, and in cyberspace. How long would it last? We have no idea. As Clausewitz says, War is the most unpredictable of all human activities. Uh, how many fatalities would there be? That's unknown. And what the outcome would be would obviously be unknown. Uh, so <coughs> the, the second question, therefore, since we've postulated uh, that it would be a war involving China on the one hand and, and, China and Japan and the US on the other, is could it be a, a major war? Uh, First question is, you know, is China a peer competitor uh, of the US-Japan alliance? The answer is no. It's militarily much weaker, it's economically much weaker, it's not as technologically advanced. Uh, we really have no idea uh, what China's military potential is because it's been untested. Uh, the last time uh, China fought a significant war, but not even what we call a kind of class A war, uh, was when it invaded uh, Vietnam and was defeated uh, by the Vietnamese in 1979, but that was a long time ago in a very limited area of Asia. Uh, so China could turn out to be a, a paper tiger, it could turn out to be a very ferocious adversary that could end up winning against the Japan-US coalition. So therefore the, the possibility of this being a major war is uh, far from insignificant. This is, as you I'm sure recognize it, I'm sorry, the you, you, this is not a, a classroom where the students are at a higher level than the lecturer, uh, so you can't see the bottom, but this is a Chinese poster from the Korean War, uh, the People's Army of, of Korea, namely the North Korean Army and the Chinese Volunteers, in plain English, the Chinese Army, uh, victory, uh, long live their victory, Bangzai victory. Um, so, I think the Hey, any questions before? I mean, I, I want this to be interactive, so before I go to chapter two, is there anything that wasn't clear that I need to clarify? Yes. Yeah. Do you think it is, uh, what did you say, uh, it's a significant or insignificant that uh, happened, actually? I think it's significant. I think the, okay. the risk is not okay. that low. You know, whether we're talking about 10% or 50%, I have no idea, but I think it is significant, yes. Okay, so then I think the first two set of questions to answer is, well, first question to answer is, is a, is a war of that magnitude possible? Uh, and there are essentially two arguments that have been used uh, in favor 
of defending the thesis that a major conflagration in East Asia, a Sino-American war with Japan in, in the picture, uh, is impossible. One is economic interdependence. Essentially that all the major players in the region, and in this case it includes the US, obviously, are, are dependent when it comes to trade, to investment, to finance, um, and that one would never fight someone with whom one is making money or with whom one has very close economic and financial ties. Uh, that's essentially the argument that uh, commerce uh, helps peace, something that you can see if you go back to Montesquieu's uh, Spirit of the Laws. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting argument. The only problem is it's totally false. Uh, it, it's totally false because first, we're unfortunately talking about humans, not about robots. Uh, and, and robots can be programmed to be rational. Uh, humans so far have been unprogrammable or when they've been programmed, they've been programmed to be even more violent than they are. Uh, so the idea, you know, make money, not war, is really a, a more modern uh, version of the slogan of the 1960s, um, make love, not war. Uh, it's interesting, but it's not universally accepted. Uh, and in fact, the historical evidence uh, disproves this. Uh, the most famous example that's always used is World War I in Europe. Uh, countries that were far more integrated than the East Asian nations are now. One could argue, well, it was a century ago. Things have changed. Um, you, know, you move to the conflict in Yugoslavia uh, in the 1990s. Uh, they were actually continuing to do business among each other as they were committing genocide. Um, the U.S. Civil War, obviously. Uh, most conflicts make very little economic sense. Some do. You know, if, if you go back to very ancient history, you go to war to essentially uh, steal the neighbor's assets, physical assets, human assets, you enslave them, and then you make a profit out of it. Uh, but not that many wars recently have proved to be profitable, and not that many wars have been fought for economic reasons, and in fact, in, in some cases, you can argue that economic interaction fosters conflicts, because it leads to commercial disagreements, it leads to segments of the population feeling that they are suffering economically because of imports uh, from another country. So trade and, fr and commerce can bring friction and hatred in many cases. So not only is the historical evidence not there, but I think the theoretical underpinnings are defective because essentially the theoretical underpinnings of interdependence assume that everything that we do is rational. Uh, and that just doesn't fit with the basic theory of, of human nature. And in this sense, humans, as, you know, as we've seen before, I mean, there's been, I mean, this is progress. You can, I mean, this is more advanced than this, uh, but the end result is not necessarily more pleasant. Uh, this one, you see the soldiers in front of the elephants not having a very good time. Uh, here, you don't see the person or persons in, in front of the uh, gun. Uh, and the reason you don't see them is they've been vaporized. Uh, second argument is nuclear deterrence. Uh, China and the United States have nuclear weapons, uh, so does India, uh, Pakistan. Uh, so they wouldn't fight one another because nuclear deterrence guarantees peace as both parties know that if they engage in war, they will both be destructed, destroyed. Uh, there are several issues there. First is the empirical data, in other words, the historical evidence. Well, the historical evidence is very limited. There are very few nuclear powers. Some of them have never deterred each other because they're either allies of US, UK, France, or, or even if they're no allies, they have no conflict. I mean, India did not build nuclear weapons to deter Israel. Israel is not particularly interested in deterring India. They're just not in the same strategic space. They have no conflict. Uh, so you're looking at a very limited set of deterrence pairs, and limited in time and limited in numbers. Uh, the theory also is not obvious, because the theory, again, assumes, it assumes rationality. Uh, and it also assumes that you know you're playing chess, and you're capable of saying, OK, I do A, then B, and C, OK, and at this point, at point Z, 26 moves ahead, we might have nuclear war, so I'm not going to do A, but you may actually end up doing B, and then from B, you reach C, and at the end, you're in a situation where war may be unavoidable. Uh, 
and, and the third one, to go back to the historical evidence, is it, is, it was not preordained that the Cold War between the United States or the confrontation between the Soviet Union and China, the two major pairs of nuclear deterrence in history so far, were going to end relatively peacefully. Uh, there are many stages in the Cold War where you could very imagine a scenario that would have led to a nuclear exchange. Um, I mean, you don't need to be a science fiction writer uh, to see that. So, any questions on this? Or any disagreement? Uh, any theoretician of nuclear war and deterrence? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, North Korea fit into this. Well, North Korea, I think, in the, in the nuclear deterrence, probably doesn't fit in yet. It's difficult because I don't have access to classified information. If I finish and if I did, it would be classified. Uh, we really have no evidence that North Korea has a usable nuclear weapon. Oh, I mean, they seem to have exploded a nuclear device, but whether they are capable of putting it on a delivery system, like essentially a missile or maybe an airplane, is far from obvious. We also don't know to what extent the U.S. has the ability to easily, preemptively destroy the North Korean nuclear arsenal. So I don't think North Korea is already in that equation. No, Kate, Kate said it could be within five years able yeah. to hit the West Coast. Yeah, Gates said it. Uh, it's not because he, <coughs> it may be true, it may not be true. Uh, you know, they've never tested missiles, so maybe they do. Maybe they, I think if you even if you assume they have nuclear weapons, it adds, you know, one other element of nuclear deterrence. But it's again, so it has a very limited history. So I don't think it undermines the idea that the that the empirical data is insufficient. Uh, up to a point, we will only know for sure that nuclear deterrence isn't always effective once we have a nuclear war. Uh, so, you no, know, we still have to wait. A nuclear war between two nuclear armed powers, that is uh, uh, something different from Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Yes? From what you're saying, I, I, am, I think you're presuming like China, US, and Japan are acting in a rational way, but what could be sources of irrational movements? Of the irrational? Are, are they, are they, are they acting rationally right now because we're not in a war? Well, I think it's... Sense, we are, we are being rational right now, but what could be irrational movements? That's so what I will get to. Scale? That's what I will, I will get to. That's the conclusion, how irrationality <laughs> runs. Uh, so war, I mean, you know, who wants war? I think at this point, uh, none of the major players do. That's not always been the case in history. You have regimes that for a variety of reasons wanted war. Uh, fascist Italy, Nazi Germany clearly are part of it. For ideological, for emotional reasons on the part of the leaders, these are regimes that wanted fighting. They would, I mean, victory without fighting for Mussolini would not have been as satisfying as victory with a war. I mean, it ended up being defeat with a war, uh, but no, you know, don't always get what you want. Uh, essentially, what you have is a set of potential conflicts. The US goal, uh, <coughs> since the end of the Cold War, has been very consistent, whether you've had uh, the administrations of the first President Bush, uh, Bill Clinton, the second Bush, and the current Obama administration, has been to incorporate China into the global slash US system to accommodate it, but to have it accept the rules of the road as they've been defined over time since 1945 by the United States and its allies. Oh, it's unclear that this is consistent with Chinese objectives. Some have argued, including in China, that this actually serves Chinese national interests, or more precisely the interests of the Communist Party, which rules China, but others have said that it denies China its rightful place in the sun. And at the same time, I think it's quite clear that the United States and Japan would not accept a radical <coughs> systemic change uh, generated by China. And, and, and last but not least, you have an ideological confrontation. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party is not what it used to be, but it is still an ideological entity by definition. And so is the United States. The United States is a country with a very high level of ideological and religious motivation component in its policy uh, and in how both its leaders and its voters uh, act and think. So what are the possible fuses? which I think goes back to, to the question of what could start things. Um, there's a rather unlimited number of them, so I've just focused on a few. Uh, there's obviously Taiwan, which is 
here. So it is a map, okay? Uh, Taiwan, as you know, uh, came under Chinese control at the beginning of the Qing Dynasty, uh, was taken over by Japan uh, following the Sino-Japanese War, the first one, um, and then was given to Republican China in 1945, and following the Civil War, became de facto an independent state under the Kuomintang and later as a democratic state. Uh, <coughs> Chinese Communist Party, probably a large, number, a large majority of Chinese national citizens think that it is part of China, something that is uh, not accepted either on a, or openly by Taiwanese leaders when they belong to the DPP or de facto by the Kuomintang leaders who claim there's only one China but they're not willing to act on it at least not on the terms that would be acceptable to Beijing. Uh, right now, the situation is fairly quiet, but there are many ways in which uh, this could become a flashpoint again. Uh, there's the South China Sea. Uh, I think we need to go to a better map uh, here. Here it is. Uh, this is this area here. Uh, there's an enormous number of territorial disputes involving China, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, and Malaysia uh, regarding the ownership of islands, islands, rocks, submerged reefs. Um, this has gotten a little more virulent uh, recently uh, in a disputed area, as you may remember, uh, A Chinese vessel reportedly cut some cables that belong to a Vietnamese uh, uh, survey boat looking at the possible oil deposits. Uh, this has also involved India because some Indian companies are involved in the Vietnam on the Vietnamese side uh, looking at potential oil exploration. Um, Japan and the Philippines have expressed a concern over this. Uh, Something that would involve, say, only China and the Philippines, or even China and Vietnam, would probably not qualify as a major global conflict. Uh, the question is, how would the United States get involved in this? Uh, you have some analysts who think that at what one point should it get really bad? Should the U.S. feel that its credibility is on the line? Uh, that states to which it is allied, like the Philippines, or countries to which it's getting closer, like Vietnam, or being threatened, it might uh, get implicated in this. Uh, then there's the U.S. With the U.S. there are no territorial issues, but there are a set of maritime issues, essentially having to do with U.S. reconnaissance activities uh, in waters and airspace near China, which the Chinese side considers to be a violation of its territorial integrity, which the U.S. considers to be acceptable under uh, the law of the sea. Uh, and as you remember, in, uh, 10 years ago, uh, a Chinese uh, fighter jet came very close to uh, U.S. Navy uh, reconnaissance plane. Uh, they collided. Uh, the reconnaissance plane ended up making an emergency landing in China. And there was another incident a few years ago uh, involving a U.S. Navy uh, survey vessel chartered by the U.S. Navy uh, doing reconnaissance uh, near the Chinese coast. Uh, then there's a whole set of issues involving Pakistan, Afghanistan, Central Asia. Not at this point, but the question you have to ask yourself is if the Taliban uh, became more powerful both in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, maybe in some areas of Central Asia, how would this play out in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs and how would this involve China? Japan, as we know, obviously there's Senkaku Island uh, and issues surrounding the um, East China Sea, as they are sometimes with. Uh, uh, South Korea. There is a submerged reef where China and South Korea disagree on its role in uh, the maritime boundary between the two states and almost every week there are clashes involving uh, Chinese fishermen uh, caught in, uh, South Korean in South Korean economic zone fishing. Uh, and sometimes they get quite violent. And then there's Russia. You know, last but not least, the relations are good, but as you know, a large part of Far Eastern Russia used to be Chinese, was taken by the Tsarist Empire because China was weak. Uh, that's a region of Russia that's very empty. Uh, China, on the other hand, isn't. Uh, there again, you have a potential in the long run uh, for conflict. Oh, sorry. Yeah? Uh, do you have any reason that we miss North Korea there? Well, North Korea, North Korea I've, I've looked at essentially conflicts that would involve directly China. North Korea is 
it's unlikely to imagine, but it'll get possible that a, a North Korean attack on South Korea would, in most, would almost certainly not involve China. I mean, it's very hard to see China doing what it did in 1950, supporting the North Koreans. Uh, the conflict, I think you're right to, to point it out, is more a question of what happens if North Korea collapses and would China want to share its uh, influence in Northern Korea with this clash with South Korea and uh, the United States. And that's indeed something to add. That's one more, thank you, that's one more reason to, one more conflict to add to the list. Uh, and then you have the domestic fuses. Uh, you have nationalism. In, in many countries, nationalism is used for domestic political gains. That is, in order to weaken your domestic opponents, you claim to be patriotic, to be defending the country. This happens in every nation, in democracies, in autocracies. Uh, many have argued it's happened in China, uh, where uh, Communist Party officials who want to score points at home against their opponents uh, argue that they are being tough against Japan, India, the United States, um, and this you know, feeds nationalism at home. But it's not unique to China. It's something you, you see in the United States, something you see in India. Um, and then there's domestic instability. Uh, domestic instability potentially in China. You know, what happens if China were to look very weak at one point? Uh, would this attract uh, the ambition of countries like India that have territorial disputes? Uh, what happens if other countries in, in the region uh, suddenly appear to be very weak? And then the separatism. Uh, so essentially, how it, not as much Tibet, but Xinjiang, how that plays into the equation uh, in the region. So, there are additional risk factors. Uh, the question of who's in charge in China, but it's an interesting one. Uh, in the traditional Soviet style, uh, systems, that the Soviet Union, say under Stalin, or even really until the end, it's clear that there's one person in one organization that makes the decision. Uh, the leader, in the case of the Soviet Union under Stalin, there was one man, uh, and there were two other sets of Soviet officials, those who agreed with Stalin and those who were dead. Uh, but even as the Soviet Union uh, became a little less of a one-man rule show, it's clear that say, under Brezhnev, the top leaders of the Communist Party were running the country when it came to political military decisions. Uh, in China, many have raised the question of who is really in charge. It is during the Senkaku crisis, where all the decisions taken by Hu Jintao and his close associates, where individual branches of various ministries and government organizations acting on their own uh, in the South China Sea, uh, some have seen the hand of various maritime safety agencies, of commercial interests. Uh, this is not unique to China today. That's an issue that one faced in Japan in the 1930s, uh, where you couldn't really, you could ask, say, 1939 in Tokyo, who's running the country? I mean, who's really making the core, the key political military decisions? And the answer would have been, well, there's a group of influential people. You couldn't have, like, gone to the equivalent of war cabinet and said, these people have 100% control of the state's national security policy. Uh, you have miscalculation, and again we're back, even if you assume that individuals are rational, uh, you, know, you think A will do B, but A doesn't do B, and then what you thought was a controllable uh, crisis escalates. Uh, and there's a lot of literature about nuclear escalation in particular. Uh, and then I think, I'll, I'll go back to your last one and then it's perceptions of U.S. weakness. Uh, the idea that the U.S., because of a lot of self-imposed uh, problems at home, a variety of other reasons linked to the financial crises, uh, is less willing uh, to defend its allies in the region, is getting weaker, that this may tempt others, in, in this case we think of China, to be a little more aggressive, and that they will have miscalculated because actually the U.S. is still, still has red lines that haven't changed that much. Uh, and Finally, I think what I like to, when I go back to these crises here, uh, I think you could imagine a scenario where just one of them can lead to a major uh, war, but the key is a cumulative effect of multiple crises. In other words, a combination of a Taiwan crisis with a worsening of ties between India and China, clashes in the South China Sea, not necessarily all of them due to the same country. And then one thing adds to another, and you already have, well, you have what you have at the bottom of the, 
of the chart. Um, so I'd like to conclude with a few ways of, of looking at this uh, from Klaus Witt, probably the man who still today is the best person to read if you're interested about war in a historical, political, philosophical context. Uh, one thing which he says, Clausewitz is a man who's a product of the rational enlightenment of the 18th century, but at the same time, one who lived through the turmoil of the late 18th and early 19th century uh, that starts with the French Revolution and ends uh, in Waterloo with the, with the defeat of Napoleon. So the first one represents the kind of rational outlook on this, which is that you don't start a war without thinking how you intend, what you intend to do with it, and how you intend to conduct it. And that's true, but the key is no one in his senses. And is every decision maker in his senses, uh, anybody who studied history and can look at a large number of decision makers, whether it's in Japan, the United States, in Europe, in China, and say, well, was he really in possession of his senses? And without being a psychiatrist, I think a lot of you will often answer the question, well, no. Uh, I don't know if there's a psychiatrist in the room. They are, uh, they are political psychiatrists. Uh, the, the CIA always has a few on hand who's supposed to write psychological profile of leaders. Now, of course, they don't sit with them and say, you know, tell me about your problems. You know, how did your mother raise you? Uh, how did you feel about your father? But I, I actually met one whose job was uh, he was working on an open project on, on Kim, uh, Kim Jong Il, and he was kind of trying to psychoanalyze Kim Jong-il. He had all sorts of interesting theories about his, I think, malignant narcissism. Uh, but no, again, this was based just on his reading about Kim, because I don't think Kim was open to a psychoanalytical session. And he had previously uh, psychoanalyzed Saddam Hussein. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting branch of, of medicine, because you're never going to face a malpractice suit. Uh, the second thing reflects Clausewitz as he reflects about the 25 years of war, uh, which ended uh, in 1815, which is that in the 18th century in Europe, um, you had what you call cabinet wars. Wars fought essentially by countries governed by a king uh, and his cabinet. And they looked at it very rationally. They said, well, you know, I should invade this province. And then said, OK, you know, I've, I've lost 10,000 men. That's all I can afford, so let's do a deal. Uh, and then they'd be peace. The people were not involved. Uh, they were subjects of the king. The soldiers were mercenaries. They were paid to fight. And that was it. Uh, it was very much like a business transaction. Uh, no hard feelings. Uh, but the process that starts in the French Revolution, and in Asia obviously includes the various revolutions um, of the 20th century, brought in the people, the masses, into the equation, uh, both in democratic states and in totalitarian states. And suddenly you have an end to restraints, because it is what Clausewitz calls the elemental fury of human beings. And that's what he experienced in the French Revolution, that's what in, in the Napoleonic Wars, uh, that's what, what Asia experienced uh, in the various wars of the Shoah era. Uh, you cannot restrain these wars. You can suddenly say, well, you know, that's it. You know, we, we fought a little too much, okay, we stop. You can't. You start a process that can only end with total victory, total defeat, or a massive number of casualties, at least. And that makes it very difficult to control uh, war and to avoid it. Uh, and you know, in the end, as, as he points out, uh, this is something that's very much bound up with chance. So when you look at wars, if you ask yourself, how will it end, uh, you can have theories, you can have ideas, uh, but you have to understand it's very, very difficult uh, to predict. So this is the end of a formal lecture. Uh, this is a, uh, I asked a friend of mine who's a Shakespeare scholar for a good quote. I thought Shakespeare had one, uh, but he wasn't sure, so he sent me this uh, quote by um, British poet C.S. Moore on uh, war coming back. War that's out of fashion, but will in again. Uh, so any questions, comments? Uh, I think we have like an hour for Q&A disagreements. Hopefully there'll be disagreement because it's much easier, much more entertaining for everybody uh, than if all, you all say thank you very much, I agree with you. Uh, How about the possibility of nuclear war that ruins uh, human civilization? You
you, you How can wonder the possibility of nuclear war uh, that ruins uh, human civilization. Oh, it, it's not impossible. You know, it, it, it's never occurred yet. Uh, but you know, there's no there's no reason to assume that you know, human civilization is immune to total de to destruction. Uh, a nuclear war, even a global one, would probably not destroy the entire human species. It might just you know, bring us back 5,000, 10,000 years, uh, into, if not into the Cro-Magnon age. Uh, but it is possible. I mean, one can very easily imagine a scenario with a global nuclear war. I, I tend to think it's unlikely. I, I think, and again, I admit we have no empirical data, but one can have war Two things. One can have wars between nuclear powers without going nuclear. In fact, there is one example, which is the war between India and Pakistan. I mean, if you were an Indian policymaker and you were asked about, well, does nuclear deterrence work? The answer would be no, because for all practical purposes, India is at war with Pakistan. I mean, what Pakistan has done in Kashmir uh, in, in the support of covert uh, operations, such as the one that uh, attacked a leading hotel um, in Mumbai, I mean, this is a war. Yet India and Pakistan are nuclear powers. Uh, but if you talk to the Indian soldiers who are being killed on the Indian side of the line of control, uh, they won't tell you we're at peace. Uh, the, the second issue, of course, is when you have nuclear war, can it stop? It's, can it be limited to just a few explosions? You know, you kill five, ten million people, and then someone says, "Okay, you know, that's let's do a deal." Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, the third one is: Are nuclear weapons still useful? Uh, for countries that have highly sophisticated arsenals, like the United States, it's very hard to think of a use for nuclear weapons. In other words, there are conventional systems, I mean, very modern ones, that are actually far more modern than nuclear weapons. I mean, the basic concept of a nuclear weapon dates from the 1940s. Uh, hydrogen bombs are a little more recent, that you can't achieve with conventional devices, and that's more effective. Uh, for, less, for states that have less developed militaries, uh, sometimes a nuclear option may look more attractive because they don't have a sophisticated or non-nuclear arsenal. Uh, if you have the mic, take advantage of it. You know. <laughs> it's an American institution. It's not Japanese one where you're very polite and you wait for everybody. You have the mic, take it. Uh, I was expecting hush-hush discussions from your side to propose. But on the other hand, I have been just uh, telling myself that this is not the uh, Temple University seminar. This is the Minatoku seminar as well. In other words, the conclusion before then, I thought you would be talking about the weakness of Japan itself as it is today. A, the citizens are not willing to back, back and fight against the invasion of the enemies. Two, lots of the weakness already found in the cyber terrorism or the military up-to-date of the weaponaries and all these matters are the showing this is a vacant spot in East Asia. In other words, we are trapped by probably China in the, let's say, conflict with South Korea. No matter what we say, Koreans are stating against the historical hard facts and all these matters. So, and every time we respond. Now, this is a trap, I think, created by Chinese. And all of a sudden, I am afraid that the fearful conclusion is US ally will break and uh, Mr. Obama, or successor, will say, hey Japan, we are moving to Guam. And you do it your own way to make the peace or war at your risk. If that happens, what are we going to do? Because we have no soldiers, and uh, we have soldiers, but collective counter-attack is not possible. The diplomacy, all these matters, and China is having more foreign currency to buy out Japanese territories. And I, I thought you would be talking about this, and I'm proud that we should be aware of the hard fact. Well, I, I wasn't going to talk about this because I knew you were going to raise a question. <laughs> I was thinking that, well, I'll, this is a long set of questions, but I, I will answer all of them. Uh, you know, are Japanese unwilling to fight? It's an interesting question. I think what we see in, in democratic societies is that public opinion can change very rapidly. 
uh, it, it's indeed very hard. I mean, Japan is, if you, if you rank countries in terms of the level of nationalism, the support they have for their armed forces, or even if you limit yourself to, de to develop mature democracies, you know, the US would probably be at one extreme uh, and Japan would be at the other, with the European countries in between, probably, you know, UK, France a little closer to the US, you know, Germany may a little closer to Japan, but probably on, on average closer to Japan. Uh, it doesn't mean it couldn't change. Uh, so I think the future in this sense is very unpredictable. Uh, the cyber war business, it's very, very difficult to know what's happening. Uh, because of all military activities, uh, electronic intelligence, signals intelligence, that area of the business is highly classified. Very few individuals know about it. Uh, with all due respect, most individuals who write about it probably don't know anything, and most people who know something about it don't write about it. I mean, it reminds me of a, a lecture I went to, I think, in the 70s about the um, European monetary system, and there was uh, an economist and statistician from the Commission in Brussels who was explaining the monetary snake, one of the ancestors of the uh, EMS, who said, well, you know, the, there are 12 people who are relevant in Brussels about this. There are six who really understand how the snake works, but they're incapable of explaining it to you. And then there are six who really know how to explain it to you. The only problem is they don't know any what they're talking about. Uh, so cyber war, what we read about in the press, could be true. It could be totally false. That is, it, it could be that the United States and Japan and others have engaged in far more aggressive cyber war activities against China, but just not publicizing it, and the Chinese government isn't. Uh, it could be that some of it is a deception. For example, we read that Mitsubishi Heavy Industries uh, servers were attacked. Now, let's assume they were attacked from China, and if the assumption is you nothing, know, they were unlikely uh, to have been attacked. Uh, by Canada or by Australia, I mean by, by Japanese, by, by allies of the US and Japan. Uh, but what about if the information in the servers was deceptive? Now, what about if the Japanese and US government planted false information about the ballistic missile system, ABM systems in the Mitsubishi servers, knowing that they were vulnerable, and then the Chinese intelligence agencies think, well, you know, in order to counter this system, we have to take into account this their radar is XYZ, and actually it's false. Uh, we don't know. Uh, signals intelligence was one, one of the most important aspects of World War II. Uh, Enigma and Ultra on the, on the European side uh, were a combination of, of Polish and British uh, intelligence analysts essentially managed to break uh, the most important German codes, and Magic on the uh, US side, which uh, broke some of the key Japanese naval and diplomatic codes. Uh, we only learned about it in the 1970s, even though it took place in World War II. So maybe we should be worried about cyber war, maybe we shouldn't. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I belong to the category that I can speak about it, but doesn't know anything. Uh, conflict with the ROK, uh, I don't think there's conflict. I think there's, prob I think there's a lack of strategic vision in Tokyo, which is that Tokyo doesn't have a problem with South Korea. Uh, whether one thinks that Takeshi Matogdo is Japanese or Korean, the fact is it's controlled by Korea and Japan doesn't want to invade it, doesn't want to engage in economic war to take it, so it would be better to say, well, you know, this is, it's Japan, it's, it's Korean, have a nice day. Uh, this, has, uh, this is essentially what, I mean, you know, in following German unification, I would call, uh, this openly stated, I mean, on behalf of the German government, that Germany accepted the borders of 1945, that is, he formally ended German claims to about a quarter of historical Germany, which had been partially uh, removed in the 1970s in the Helsinki agreements, but not formally. Uh, no, he was acknowledging that places like Königsberg, which played a fairly important role in German history, weren't German anymore, because he realized it was in Germany's strategic interest to have good relations with Poland and decent relations uh, with Russia. Uh, the fact that the Japanese cabinet cannot find the strategic wisdom to acknowledge that Takeshima is not Japanese is very strange to me because even if one thinks that Takeshima is really Japanese, it is not exactly to Japan what Königsberg or Breslau or Danzig were to Germany. I mean, Immanuel Kant was at Königsberg. Uh, I don't think any great Japanese philosopher ever taught at Takeshima Daigaku. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think the problem is fundamentally in Tokyo. Uh, trapped by Chinese? Uh, I think to some extent the trap in this case of Korea is self-inflicted here. Uh, I mean, not to say that there isn't a level of 
uh, exploitation on the part of Korean politicians. I mean, the idea on the Korean side that Togdo is threatened by Japan is obviously ridiculous. Uh, there's no Japanese threat to Togdo. Uh, U.S. ally, break. I think right now, I mean, Japan is in a fairly safe situation for the simple reason that Japan is so vital to U.S. national interests. Uh, the U.S. could not be an Asian Pacific power without Japan, uh, without the support of the self-defense forces, without the bases, without the economic, political, multi-alliance with Japan. Uh, whether this will always be the case of, you know, nothing lasts a thousand, ten thousand years, but I think for the time being it's fairly stable. So, I, I, the Chinese buying assets in Japan, I think that's very, very good. Uh, because it's something you can confiscate in case of war. Uh, you know, if you look at the U.S. pharmaceutical industry, uh, where does the U.S. pharmaceutical industry come from? Well, part of it comes from the German pharmaceutical industry, which had significant assets in the United States, and in 1917, the U.S. government said, we've got news for you, uh, these are now American assets. Uh, and also, the more Chinese, for example, buy real estate in Japan is good, because the Chinese who do so are probably fairly well connected. So it allows Japanese intelligence to spy on them. You know, we can wiretap their phones, everything, put uh, bugs in their uh, living rooms, or uh, can be blackmailed, uh, can be both. So you want, you want people whom you consider to be potential enemies to be on your territory because you can study them. Uh, you can corrupt them. Uh, so that, I, I would say, you know, I, would say I would love every senior member of the Communist Party to have a house uh, in Tokyo and a country home in Hokkaido. Mm -hmm. The idea. Uh, Would you say the same thing to China buying up Japanese government bonds, which might happen? Right? That's that's even better because you can always cancel them. They stay in the bank. <laughs> they stay. I mean, technically, I know there's somebody who is here in finance. I know there's some, but maybe they want to remain anonymous. Uh, <laughs> but these are held by the Bank of Japan because again, denominated. Uh, you know, there's this story. You know, if you if you owe if if you go to, if your banker calls you and says you know you you owe a hundred thousand yen to me you have a problem but if you call your banker and you say you know I owe you a trillion dollars it's your banker who has a problem <laughs> uh, as, as anybody who is my telling so and you know have your own way uh, that's what Mikhail Gorbachev told Eric Erniker you know that's what they call the Sinatra doctrine have it my way I mean. Gorbachev and Shevardnadze told Eastern Europe, look, you know, everybody can do what he wants, and we're not going to support you. And that's what he told Harry Koenigsegg and East Germany collapsed. Now, fortunately, Japan is not East Germany, and I think right now the Sinatra doctrine uh, is not part of President Obama's uh, conception of international relations. Now, you know, if Herman Cain becomes president, uh, who knows? And if Rick Perry becomes president, he may not remember what the treaty. <laughs> So, questions? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for a very uh, wide-ranging, interesting presentation. And I, I'd like to question uh, one one of your seemingly central uh, premises of your analysis, and that is that the U.S., Japan, the Western alliance, has uh, technological and military superiority over China. And. My concern is it's just a matter of time. If China continues to grow economically at 10% a year, and you can see similar rates of remarkable um, acceleration of their output of scientific productivity, granted much of it is of questionable quality, but it's only a matter of time until they bring the quality up. And on the other side in the US and many Western countries, you have severe economic problems, you have stagnation, you have growth uh, either zero or on the scale of one or two percent a year. This goes on year after year. It's just a matter of time until that changes. Well, uh, there, there's several answers to this. One, of course, is the one that uh, John Maynard Keynes gave, which is in the long run we're all dead. Uh, now, longevity has increased, especially in Japan, so we, you're right. We should be worried for the, the long term. Uh, the second one is it's possible. I mean, what the world will look like in, in 20 or 30 years, uh, it's impossible to predict. Uh, the third one is I think most of the Western alliance's problems have been self-inflicted. So I think it's more a question indeed of, of severe problems in the West. Um, in the West defined as including Japan. I mean, the, 
Well, I think on the Chinese side, it's an, on the military side, we don't really know how they would perform. We don't know how well they're trained, how motivated they are, command and control. They're all sorts of, I mean, looking at hardware isn't the way you, you look at things, and that's very difficult. The second one is, it's a question that a lot of Chinese have raised, is the ability to innovate and to really run a modern economy in a system that doesn't have the rule of law yet and doesn't have effective property rights. And you know, what we still see is that it seems that every Chinese who has money or power sends his kids to be educated overseas. Uh, reportedly, the next president of China has his daughter at Harvard. Uh, we still see that a lot of, and again, the Financial Times and Wall Street Journal reported recently a large number of wealthy Chinese have bought real estate overseas, not as an investment, basically as a parachute, uh, have often tried to have kids acquire foreign nationality, uh, foreign residency rights, and all this. Uh, so you have to ask a question, if the people who are best informed about China are, are behaving that way, uh, should we be so optimistic about the future of China? Uh, and I think the, educa you know, the educational side is quite clear, but everybody in China who knows the educational system seems to think it's not that good. It's not good enough for their children. Uh, but you know, in the long run, who knows? I mean, that's really not an argument for complacency on the part of the, of the US uh, policymaking class. I'm uh, far more concerned with North Korea than I am China for the reason that North Korea has, except for losing the Korean War, never been funded, punished for hitting its atrocities, and there are lots of them. They have a struggle over it. They don't even have a little house. Can you, I think, is the mic on? I think you're speaking into the office. Yeah. The question, sorry, the question was North Korea had not been has not been punished for anything since the Korean War. Except and its loss and, and yeah, right. after attacking the South, it was punished yeah. for the war yeah. and had a Pyongyang bomb. Yeah. That's why they put everything underground now, and we don't know where they have their nuclear weapons, which makes them a threat. But uh, you had the raid on the Blue House, you know, you, uh, and, and uh, no punishment for that in Rangoon. Two people that I personally knew, uh, one of whom was the uh, brother-in-law of the foreign minister of Korea, who was killed in the Rangoon bombing that Chunda Wong dismissed because he had to go to the bathroom at the time that the bomb exploded. Uh, you have this fortification of uh, artillery and missiles 60 miles north of, of South Korea, which as the North Koreans frequently re remind the South, and turn Seoul into, quote, a sea of fire, and it can. Uh, American generals have estimated hundreds of thousands, not thousands, but hundreds of thousands would be killed, not injured, killed in, in an attack, and there's nothing that could be done to, do to prevent that. Uh, and uh, in Don Oberdorfer's book, uh, uh, William Perry, oh, by the way, uh, all of the American bases in Japan, for instance, Joe Potter and so forth, are under the United Nations Command, not the American Command, the United Nations Command. Japan is obligated to allow those bases to be used to defend Korea. They keep that a careful secret, but uh, Japan is an old hand at secret diplomacy. They had 56 secrets exposed by the, uh, the coming of the new government here. But at any rate, there's, there's been no punishment of, of, of North Korea. And Japan, oh, and one other thing, at, at the time when uh, Clinton was ready to go to war, and Jimmy Carter barely made it into Pell uh, uh, to stop it, there were 80,000 American dependents that needed to be rescues and the United States asked Japan to take them and didn't have to give an answer. Uh, and uh, William Perry said after the war, if, if the Japanese, if, if, if conflict had broken out and the Japanese did not uh, uh, give any assistance, that would have been the end of the treaty. I, I think the reason I do focus on North Korea is I'm looking essentially at what could bring out a major large-scale confrontation involving China, the US, Japan, and 
the geopolitics of North Korea are such that a conflict involving North Korea would almost certainly A, be limited to North Korea on one side and the alliance on the other, South Korea, US, and in fact, Japan, would not involve China or Russia. It's, it's hard. One cannot think of any scenario in which they would go and, and support North Korea. Uh, secondly, I mean, to contradict Clausewitz about that war is very unpredictable, one can really not imagine a scenario in which this would not end with the defeat of North Korea. There might be a lot of fatalities, I totally agree. There might be hundreds of thousands, so it would be a catastrophe. But it would be limited in geographical scope, in, geopolitic, in its geopolitical impact, and its duration. It would basically be the time it takes for the combined forces command of the US and South Korea to destroy North Korean artillery, to go after their missiles, and to destroy their army. So it would, would be violent. The Chinese are always talking about this. Lips and teeth. No, it is this, this area, a uh, buffer zone. Yeah, but that. Why would they not do that? Because the, the purpose of fighting for North Korea, North Korea starting a war, would be really the worst thing that happened for China. Now, I think also in this case, now, if there's another conflict, things going on in the South China Sea, whatever, Taiwan, then it's part of the global thing. Uh, I think it's fairly clear, clear that both the United States, South Korea, Japan are willing to cut China a fairly good deal. You know, they would not want U.S. forces based north of the, four, of the 38th parallel. Uh, how would this play out? I don't know in terms of technical details. But I don't think North Korea has the same explosive capability in terms of ignite, ignite, igniting a global conflict as it had before uh, because its relationship with China has been altered so much. Uh, in, again, in, in, in the context of several other wars going on, yes, but not on. But I, I mean, it, that there is a possibility of a war in Korea killing hundreds of thousands of individuals, that's obvious. It, it is not what I'm focusing on today. Because well, I'm really focusing on the China and US. focusing on the North Koreans building nuclear weapons today. Because, that's, uh, because I, I don't, it's hard again, this does not involve a con. On one side, you just have North Korea. And on the other, you have the rest. So it's not a, ma a major conflict. Might, in this definition, has to involve major states on both sides. Uh, and North Korea is not going to fire missiles on behalf of China, and China surely isn't going to. Uh, so that's why it's, it's, it's a different animal. It's, a, it's fundamentally North Korea. It's a, it's a regional conflict that can be very lethal, as opposed to a global one, uh, which is one that where it starts on, on at a Sino-American level. The, the only question, I mean, there's always a risk that it could ignite a Sino-American confrontation. I think that's very low uh, because of the current situation. Well, Japan has already expressed enough fear yeah. of North Korean mm -hmm. missiles yeah. to join the United yeah. States in developing mm -hmm. joint missile defense, have it not? Yes, but that's the fact that Japan is afraid of a regional conflict involving Korea makes a lot of sense. Uh, but it, it's not. A global war. I mean, North Korea also is a dying proposition. Yeah, those missiles are the yeah. ones that uh, Robert Gates was talking about. Yeah. We were able to get the West, West Coast yeah. in five five years yeah. from now, and which Japan has said, no, we won't, we won't knock any of those yeah. down if it flies over Japan. The, the, I think the Japanese discussion about how it would play in, in ballistic missile defense was one of these Satemai Honne thing. I mean, officially, at one point, the Japanese position was it cannot. Japan cannot be involved in helping the U.S. intercept missiles that are going to strike the U.S. It's very hard to believe that this was the Honne. I think de facto Japan would have been involved in this because the Japanese government understood this would have been the end of the alliance with the United States. And also, when North Korea starts firing missiles, you're not sure where they're going to land. So you want, from a Japanese point of view, you want to be involved as much as you can in preventing these missiles from reaching their targets. So um, may I get to a little bit more, um, let's say, um, timely discussion at the, um, which is currently running. So um, on your presentation, page six, economic interdependence. Um, so first of all, uh, the US 
and uh, the European Union, they are currently regarding China with a certain air of fear because um, China is buying their ways into their markets, buying lots of dollars, buying lots of euro, and what's um, therefore happening that basically um, this seems a very rational uh, behavior from the Chinese side, uh, that they kind of like uh, get this leverage into those um, economic areas. So now I wonder, in the light of the Japanese government joining TPP and all the countries in this economic space, that they um, are kind of like also part of a US strategy to kind of isolate China, which I believe is not very likely to start any conflict uh, because American um, economic uh, space as well as the European space, I mean, they are customers of China. So China can, could China afford a conflict with basically the world? Well, I, I'll answer the thing. I think the, the situation which China finds itself now, which is holding an enormous amount of foreign currency assets, mostly US dollar, perhaps some, as well as some euros, it's not necessarily, if you look at it from a Chinese point of view, it's not necessarily a good situation. I mean, first it reflects a very mercantilist policy, one that actually hurt the Chinese people in terms of their ability to consume. I mean, something that very much Japan did several decades ago. Uh, so it has contributed to imbalances within China. And uh, now, does it also increase your leverage? Yes and no, because it means you're extremely vulnerable to the value of a foreign currency which you don't control. And in the end, we don't even own these assets because they're actually controlled by either the Federal Reserve in the States or the European Central Bank. So if I were kind of a political military guy in China talking to the finance ministry, I'd say, well, you know, maybe this isn't very smart, actually, because we're very vulnerable to this. Uh, so the, the ownership of assets, it's, it's not as simple as saying that a lot of or trade it. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, oh. Sell all the dollars and all the euros in one shot. Yeah. What happens to the currency? Well, the question what happens, well, first then, if you think of the economic side, it's obviously very bad for, well, it, it, it lowers the value of the dollar and the euro. It obviously makes it impossible for China to export. Because certainly, its currency is appreciated enormously. Um, so that's not a significant problem. Uh, in fact, it's a major one. Uh, the second one is even whether they'd be allowed to do it. <laughs> whether, whether you know, actually, the US or Europe wouldn't decide that, you know, this is not, suddenly become untradeable. Uh, when you start talking about <coughs> financial activities that amount to war, uh, you stop talking to your lawyers, and you actually, you know, do what you want to do. Um, and actually, there are, there are various laws in the books that make it very easy uh, to define a country as an enemy state and deny it essentially the, its property rights in the U.S. Um, the, the second thing, the TPP, is this part of the U.S. policy to isolate China, strengthen the link with Japan? Possibly. I, I'm not a trade expert. There are people in the room who know a lot more. Uh, but obviously that's something that the U.S. policymakers uh, have been thinking of. You know, could China afford a war with its customers? Well, again, it's if you look at it, I mean, if your job is to increase China's economic growth and you ask, well, is war a good idea? You to say no. The question is, are you the guy who's in charge of policy making? Uh, there are many countries that have gone to war in situations where it didn't make sense, uh, economically, politically, strategically. Uh, but they did it. Uh, they did it either because they wanted it, because they stumbled into it as a result of miscalculations, escalation, uh, because they didn't know how it would play out. The war would be very easy. You know, we'll be back, as everybody said in Europe, you know, we'll be back by Christmas. Uh, they came back, but instead of being Christmas 1914, it was Christmas 1918, and almost everybody who went in 1914 was dead by Christmas 1918. Uh, so uh, you know, you're back to this issue. Can you afford it? Maybe not, uh, but you did it. I mean, the, I think the most recent war that's fascinating is really the wars in Yugoslavia. Because you talk about very highly integrated uh, societies, uh, economically it made no sense. I mean, there a lot. I mean, Serbia is a wreck. Uh, in Bosnia, uh, what did they gain? Probably nothing. Uh, they weren't even age-old hatreds. In Kosovo, yes, there was a long history going back centuries of animosity 
uh, between Kosovars and Slavs. But places like Sarajevo, almost everybody was married to someone from a diff different ethnicity. Religiosity was very low, but political entrepreneurs managed to create this sense of ethnic, religious, national hatred, uh, and they killed each other, and they, in very large numbers, uh, given how small they were. And this is, I mean, not unique uh, in the region. I mean, if you think of the Middle East conflicts. I mean, they're not fighting over uh, economics. Uh, they're fighting about lots of other things, you know, whether it's religion, territory, history, the past, the present. Uh, so that's, that's the short answer to could China afford to fight its customers. Uh, is there any possibility uh, to avoid war that causes uh, many casualties? Uh, can any sports adventure spirit, uh, can any sports or adventure spirit uh, change uh, any instinct, human instinct, to last, uh, to go to war? Well, can you, I think if you want to avoid a war with major casualties, there are several ways of doing it, not fighting it, fighting it very quickly, and winning in a few hours, in a few days, that often limits casualties, uh, especially for the winner. Uh, can you change human nature? Uh, so far, the record is pretty bad. Um, I mean, I, I think you know, if, you, if you were to compare a, a human being from our century, 21st century, to someone, say, from the 5th century BC, you know, the great era of uh, Chinese and Athenian thought, probably not much improvement. Uh, if you were to go back to Neanderthal, probably marginal. Uh, but I think in terms of one's willingness to go out and kill, uh, it really hasn't changed. Uh, so you know, can it be changed? I think it's a philosophical issue. It may be that at one point we will develop chemicals uh, that can improve human nature. Uh, or, or, no, or a bionic machine where essentially we merge the brain and a computer and we instill rationality uh, into the system, uh, but we haven't made that much progress yet in science. Um, so um, I think so far, uh, you know, I mean, we're in Asia. If you see what happened in Cambodia not long ago, uh, I think something like 25% of the Cambodian population was murdered by other Cambodians. Uh, you know, they were not different from us uh, genetically, uh, physiologically. Uh, they did it, and there's no reason to assume we can't do it either. Yeah. The slide that, sorry, the slide that uh, has the title, Who Wants War? No One But, last bullet point, ideological confrontation. What do you think the nature, the real ideological confrontation between the U.S. and China would be? I mean, hard to say what communism is anymore. Human rights, hard to say how important that is to the U.S. I mean, what, what kind of confrontation would, would trigger war? I think it's one that's obviously different than the one that existed between the Soviet Union and the West. Um, it's one, an ideolo ideology, I should have included nationalism. I think on the, uh, on the Chinese side, uh, it is to the extent that we understand what the leadership of the party wants, a clear ideological opposition to Western liberalism. I mean, clearly the leadership of the Communist Party thinks it's a bad ideology, and I think rightly so, it, it feels that it is under attack, uh, in that even if the United States does not actively promote human rights and democracy in China the way it has in other parts of the world, everything the United States does in the end does it. You know, I mean, the American cyberspace promotes American ideas. Uh, American education does. And, you know, you, member of the Communist Party kind of suck because you know the educational system is better in the U.S. than China, so you send your kids there, uh, but they're getting bad ideas, uh, everything that's published in the U.S. So there is that sense, I think, of being under attack, even though from the American point of view, the United States doesn't think it's leading the attack, which is the nature of American society in itself is aggressive for someone who's opposed to American values. You know, the, the same way, if you're in a place like Saudi Arabia, you have a very conservative Wahhabite conception of what is right and what is wrong, you will consider that the US and the West is waging war against you, just because of what the West is. Uh, I, I think on the US side, it's not active, it's not as active as um, it was during the Cold War, but I think you can very imagine, easily imagine a situation uh, in case of conflict 
where suddenly the argument that China is communist, is godless, uh, has traction among um, a significant proportion of the U.S. electorate. And I think to go back, this is not as much ideology as nationalism. We have to understand the Chinese perception of history. Uh, from the mid-19th century, from the beginning of the uh, 19th century, from the beginning of the Opium Wars, uh, to the end of the Japanese invasion. I mean, China spent a year, a century, being invaded by Westerners or by Japanese who had essentially copied the Western way of dealing with China. Uh, this obviously has left a very deep scar in the Chinese psyche, and understandably so. Uh, and this had happened to, to the United States, to Italy, to Britain, to countries that have never experienced this in recent history. Uh, they have a bad feeling about it. Uh, you know, the, especially, I mean, China felt it was the center of the world. It is the center, I mean, it is the root of all East Asian civilization. Uh, it had been very powerful, it had been respected, its area, and suddenly a bunch of barbarians arrived, behave in many cases like barbarians, I mean, destroy historical treasures in Beijing, uh, occupy the country, impose foreign ideas, foreign religions, show absolutely no respect uh, for the civilization. Uh, uh, have any of you seen uh, 55 Days in Peking? Charleston Eston, you know, 1960s movie about the what we would call today the peacekeeping operation, basically the, the Western and Japanese intervention uh, during the Boxer Rebellion. You know, you look at how the Chinese are portrayed in this Hollywood movie. First, most of the Chinese are played by Caucasian actors. Uh, they have long nails. Uh, they look. I mean, I mean, this is this is the stuff of you know, racism. Uh, a condescending look, the only good Chinese are the ones who've converted to Christianity, you know, the young girl who's half Chinese, half American, and she's very nice, she has long hair. I mean, you, know, you look at this, you're Chinese, and this, there's a reason to be unhappy about this. Uh, and, and that has, to what extent this still has traction in China, I don't know, but it clearly has. I think in, even if you're communist, I mean, if you're communist, you look at Western imperialism in a positive way, because if it hadn't been for Western imperialism, communism would not have succeeded. And in fact, if you go to one of the history museums in, in, uh, in Beijing, or it starts, the first exhibit is on the French Revolution, because from a Marxist-Leninist point of view, it starts a process that helps the victory of communism. But as there are very few Marxists left in China, I think very few Chinese now say to themselves, oh, thank God for the Westerners and the Japanese. Uh, they killed millions of our citizens, uh, they destroyed our culture, but thanks to them, Marxism was able to triumph. Uh, they look at it as, no, we're Chinese, we're mistreated. And, and, and that's, that is part of the ideological historical confrontation uh, that affects uh, the Chinese perception of the West and of Japan. Uh, I think the possibility of U.S.-China war or U.S. versus China-Japan alliance will come in the near future simply because I think the Chinese are well aware that they are so much at disadvantage at this stage and it takes two to get to the war and I don't think Chinese are willing to because militarily they are aware that 1,800 nuclear missiles are targeted there thanks to the end of the Cold War, the most of the strategic nuclear subs are now in the Western Pacific. And uh, like you were saying earlier, uh, infantry, Navy, Air Force, whatever you take, they are fully aware they are no match at the United States. And another thing is that I think the U.S. strength is not simply the physical capabilities of the 11 nuclear uh, aircraft carrier groups, task forces, versus none, just about to make one on the Chinese side. But uh, in addition to that, I think the Chinese realize this. The real strength of the United States is that they have a perfect alliance in the Western Europe, NATO. They have a strong alliance in Asia, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Philippines, and Southeast Asia at large. And the Western Hemisphere is theirs. And realizing that, it will take some time for Chinese to start bringing up some of their friends. They are fast on their way, especially in Southeast Asia. 
because of geographical propinquity, it's obvious that many of the countries, including Japan, have more trade. It's, it's far more a good job, a good uh, business to do with China now. Uh, so considering this, it will take some time before Chinese will have more confidence to be one-on-one -on -one against the United States. And they are really working so hard on that and different ways to, to achieve that as soon as possible, such as those nuclear, to paralyze those nuclear uh, capabilities and nuclear subs and uh, aircraft carriers, whatever, whatever the US has, just to attack the headquarters who are commanding these powerful uh, military capabilities. They're doing that, they're doing it in the space, they're doing it in the cyber area. So someday, within this century, when the United States would pass becoming, losing all these intelligent, uh, capable white population, and I don't have any uh, bias against the other races, but I think in 2070, who knows, the United States of America, the content is all Hispanic, so Hispanic will definitely be the, one of the first languages. So when these days come, like, 2070, 2080, that will be when there will be a danger of a serious challenge from China. And my question is, how do you think the United States could avoid that? Well, I, I, I think that actually the diversification of the United States is an enormous advantage. I mean, as the United States becomes a more diverse society, it allows it first to grow demographically, uh, to expand its size to the rest of the world. Uh, so the fact the U.S. is less and less just a, a white European society makes it stronger and stronger. So that's that's very much a positive uh, thing that's happened in the U.S. Uh, and that you know, is, has not happened in other countries. Uh, so it, that, that, that's the first thing, uh, uh, first argument that I, I would make. Uh, the second one, you know, 2070, you know, it's long, I mean, I'll be 109. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, you know, longevity has increased. Uh, it's very difficult to make predictions <laughs> that far away. Uh, I would just go back to one thing. I and mean, again, there's the issue of, do you already plan a war? Does it happen as a result of miscalculation? Does it happen because some elements of your government or your armed forces are not fully under your control? Uh, secondly, you can rationally think that you can defeat a far stronger enemy uh, because war, as Clausewitz tells us, is political. And, you know, first example is Vietnam. Now, Vietnam had enormous assistance from the Soviet Union and China, in North Vietnam, but still, even including the assistance it got uh, from the communist world, it was far weaker than the United States. But, you know, in the end, uh, it was the North Vietnamese that took Saigon, not the United States that took Hanoi, because the politics of it favored the North Vietnamese. I mean, the politics and their military abilities as well. Uh, so there are many cases of weaker countries that have gone to war, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully, against stronger opponents, because they believe that the other opponent cannot bring its entire forces to bear, either because it's busy in other theaters, they may think it's not as committed to war as they are. Uh, the other example is, to be, I mean, Japan, Japanese government, cabinet did make the decision to go to war against the United States. Now, by 19, late 41, Japan had gone through a succession of steps that made war more likely, but still, they decided to attack the U.S. I think a lot of Japanese policymakers knew that the U.S. was far stronger than Japan, but they calculated not only totally irrationally that they could end the war in a way that was satisfactory to Japan. It turned out not to be the case, and I think it was probably the wrong calculation, but you could see how they made it. Uh, so. An imbalance in, in, in power doesn't preclude the weaker side from attacking the stronger one. Um, what we see in the way with Pakistan and with India, I mean, India is not blameless in what's happening in India and Pakistan, but I think most would argue that most of the blame uh, has to be put on the Pakistani side. Uh, Pakistan is much weaker than India, but for a variety of reasons, uh, it's still around. Thank you for your lecture. Um, um, who 
case solves it for hearts. I think one of them is uh, merchants of death. Is? One of them is merchants of death. Oh, merchants of death. Okay. Well, you know that's it's interesting. After after World uh, War One, uh, there's a lot of literature about the fact that the merchants of death, or the cannon merchants in, in plain English, uh, weapons manufacturers, uh, were responsible for the war. Uh, Michael Moore in uh, Fahrenheit 911, you know, has these pictures of. Uh, uh, weapons being sold to Saudi Arabia, arguing they, they wanted war. I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I, I think it's hard to think of a country where uh, arms manufacturers control policy. Uh, they have profits to be made for arms races. They have a prof I mean, an arms race is beneficial to them, I and mean, they obviously want defense budgets to be large. But I think it's, I can not think of any single war of any significance, where you could say that the defense industry bore any responsibility for the conflict happening. Uh, and you know, it's linked up. A lot of literature, of course, on militaries wanting war. But professional militaries generally do not want war. Now, there are militaries that aren't necessarily professional in the way that Huntington defines them in, in the soldier of the state. Uh, but again, I don't think, uh, to go back to the merchants of death, I think they're one can argue about the size of defense budgets, about how the defense industry should be run, but I think they're totally they're not responsible for any conflict I can think of. Uh, it's, uh, 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 it's caused by the human nature, you think? Well, it's going to be, I mean, human nature is the root of it because humans make decisions. You know, I remember when I, I, I worked in a, in a financial institution, I asked uh, someone who's fairly senior, who, I asked them how the computer transaction costs, because there was a, a computer program, an Oracle database, where you inputted some numbers and you got the transaction costs. And he told me, well, I don't know. The computer does it. Well, the answer is, of course, not. The computer doesn't do it. Uh, there's a guy who programmed it who defined transaction costs. So yes, human nature, I mean, humans are the root of everything that happens. Uh, but different wars are different causes. I mean, some are fundamentally ideological. I mean, think World War II on the German side, I mean, Adolf Hitler wanted war for a variety of ideological reasons. Uh, sometimes it's a combination of religious conflicts, sometimes it's territorial disputes that have been going on, sometimes it's a rational calculus of what makes sense, of sometimes blame can be apportioned among most of the participants, sometimes there's one state that's really responsible, at least bears 99% of a responsibility. So every war has its unique causes. Uh, they can be economic, demographic, religious, political, territorial, historical, diplomatic. Uh, there was something known as a football war between, I think it was Honduras and El Salvador following a football game that went badly. I mean, there were other reasons for it, but it's known as the football war. Uh, yeah. So I think there will be, I think, uh, supposed to be a football game between North Korea and Japan at one point. <laughs> football or baseball? I don't know. There's something, I think it's a World Cup, I think it's a World Cup game. So you, know, you could imagine you know, uh, Japan wins in North Korea, North Korea attacking to avenge the uh, honor of a North Korean uh, team. I have a couple of questions. Um, Do you think U.S. finds China easier to understand? Because its ambition may be clearer. So that's one question I'd like to ask your personal view. And the second question is, uh, how do you think Japan should play its role in diffusing the tension in the region so that we can avoid the war? What are the key factors for success? Okay. Thank you. Does the U.S. understand China? Well, of course, you know, we, we talk about countries, but I mean, countries are individuals. They are 1.3 billion Chinese. Each of them has a different personality. Even if you limit yourself to the policymakers, they don't all look at things the same way. You know, do American policymakers understand China? Do Chinese policymakers understand Americans? Uh, the short answer is probably no. Uh, most people don't understand others, um, especially when there are significant cultural gaps. Uh, it's, they probably are. I, th I think if you look at the American sinologists, uh, there probably is a group of Americans who really understand Chinese culture, Chinese history. Uh, 
how China works. Uh, do most American policymakers do? Some have probably better understanding than others. Uh, do China, the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party understand the US? Probably not. If only you think of the way they've been trained, educated, it's unlikely they understand anything outside of China. Uh, there are obviously a lot of Chinese who are educated in China who spend a lot of time there. We probably understand it well. Uh, do they have influence over the policymakers? Uh, do they give good advice? That's not obvious. And sometimes you can understand each other and still end up fighting. I mean, there are lots of countries that are very similar uh, that have gone to war. And, uh, of course, you have civil wars as well. Uh, you know, what can Japan uh, do to prevent war? Uh, it's a long list. I think uh, fundamentally, Japan is a US ally. Uh, most of what Japan does in accordance with US policy. And uh, I think. Surely, I mean, on the history issue, Japan has done a, a fair amount. It's really apologized. It's given an enormous amount of economic assistance to China. Uh, the problem is, if, if you compare Japan to other countries and how they've dealt with their past, you know, Japan probably gets a B. I mean, a lot of nations have not dealt with, with past crimes and whatever. The problem for Japan is that because Imperial Japan was allied to Nazi Germany, it would always be compared to what Germany did, because it's basically, you know, People are compared to the ex-spouse, uh, and that's it. You know, and Japan was married to Adolf Hitler at one point, and so we say, well, you know, this is what the successors did. And unfortunately, Germany for unfortunately for Japan, Germany is a country that has done the most uh, to deal with its past for a variety of historical, political, and philosophical reasons. Uh, and Japan doesn't get a B compared to, to what Germany would have. Uh, so one can think of this is still some of the history textbooks. They're not burned. Okay. One can think of the Yasukuni. Uh, that has been solved by this government. No one in the cabinet goes. Uh, but there still are parliamentarians who go there. Uh, one can probably uh, think on the Chinese side there's actually more to be done. Because Chinese education uh, does not teach young Japanese, young Chinese about what Japan is today. That is, it's a peaceful liberal democracy. Uh, because the fight against Japan has become a justification for rule by the Communist Party. And that's unfortunately very little that Japan can do um, about this. Uh, I think improving relations with Korea is probably something that Japan could do. And there again, you have the, the history issue, the conflict women, paying compensation to them. You know, the argument that, well, the tr 1965 treaty says Japan has no obligation, maybe legally, technically right, but politically does not serve Japanese interests. Uh, as same thing for the claim to, to, to the island as well. Uh, and that would, I think, reinforce, uh, improve conditions in the region because it would convince China that it can not play the Korea card against, um, against Japan. The same for the Northern Territories. It's very unlikely, it's very hard to imagine a situation where Russia would give back the Northern Territories. I mean, for something that I think a lot of Japanese and Americans don't understand, uh, 25, 26 million Russians died during the Second World War. This is considered to be something that was bought at the price of 26 million dead. Now, you can argue most of these Russians died because Stalin was a mass murderer and a very poor uh, diplomat, but that's not how it's perceived in, in Russia. Uh, and that would, I think, also do, do a lot of good. Uh, you know, Japan can uh, probably try to have more Chinese students here, more Chinese immigrants. Uh, relationships, also good for Japan, good for Japan's demography. It creates a cadre of people who would understand China and Japan. Uh, but up to a point, because of Japan's diplomatic political situation, uh, its role in the bigger picture is somewhat limited. I mean, in the end, it's a Sino-American issue. Uh, you know, and Japan is part of that alliance, uh, which has and it's been very profitable for Japan, but that means I can't think offhand of a lot of actions that it could take to, to fundamentally alter the situation. Yeah. Okay, uh. Uh, related to the, uh, the Q&A between the, uh, the former question and you, uh, what do you think the, the role of South Korea should be? Uh, uh, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think the that that's uh, the, the role of South Korea oh, to, to the stability of the East Asia. I don't think that they are always rational as Japan isn't, but uh, as they are rational to a, to, to a 
to some extent and that they can do something to the severity of this. Yeah, you know, South Korea has this enormous burden, which is North Korea. Basically, how to deal with North Korea as it is, and how to handle North Korea after it collapses. Therefore, South Korea has very limited, doesn't have that much extra room to do more, because it has to deal with this enormous problem. I mean, South, South Korea is more a consumer of security in a way than a generator, not because it doesn't want to, but because history has placed it in this horrible situation uh, where it has this enemy to its north, very close, as, as Sam pointed out, within artillery range of the heart of South Korea, an enemy of Seoul. Uh, and if and, if and when South North Korea collapses, it will have to absorb an extremely poor third world country whose population has been brainwashed uh, by the Kim dynasty for decades uh, into a modern liberal democracy. And this will be the task of a generation, will require enormous assistance from outside. Um, so South Korea's ability, I mean, one shouldn't ask South Korea to do more. I mean, it already carries a heavier burden than anybody else in the region. You mentioned um, when you discussed possible fuses for such a conflict, international fuses. You had listed Pakistan, Afghanistan, Central Asia. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about that, particularly with regards to Pakistan and Afghanistan, since you have such a large U.S. military presence in Afghanistan? And I think well, the question is, intentions. I mean, essentially, the U.S. presence will, uh, will go sooner or later, probably sooner. And I think it, it doesn't matter who whether Barack Obama is re-elected or not. Uh, possibility for Taliban and Taliban-related elements uh, to have more influence in, in Afghanistan will probably grow. Uh, the, the, the US mission of transforming Afghanistan, I think, was hopeless from the beginning. Uh, Pakistan is so large, I mean, the US isn't going to change it. I mean, there are more inhabitants in Pakistan than in Japan. Uh, the potential for Pakistan to become even more unstable to have uh, extremist elements gain more influence is again there. Whether it will happen, I'm not sure. But so you could very much imagine a kind of Taliban-like set of groups having more power in the region. Uh, and at one point, for a variety of reasons, uh, supporting the Uyghurs or supporting Taliban-like elements in the Uyghurs. Most Uyghurs probably are not Taliban-oriented, but it doesn't take that many people to start a few suicide bombings and kind of agitate things and then generate repression from the Han Chinese and from the PLA, and then you saw the process where you alienate even moderates among the Uyghurs, uh, and they're spreading to some Central Asia. So they, all this area has the potential for, for violence. Uh, have this affects China? Well, Xinjiang is currently in part of China. Uh, there's no Chinese government's never going to give it independence, at least not willingly. And of course, probably, what do you do with the Han Chinese who are there? Do you remove them as foreign settlers? Uh, and that adds, that's not something I can imagine the US wanting to play a role. I mean, the United States isn't going to supply uh, explosives and weapons to insurgents in, in, in um, Xinjiang the way it did uh, to fight the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. At, at least, unless the United States is already at war with China or preparing for war with China in, in other fronts, and then it decides, you know, whatever will weaken China will do it. I mean, so this isn't going to be the thing that's going to start a US conflagration. US Chinese conflagrations, it's one thing that can increase violence in the region, uh, probably make the Chinese government, you can very well imagine a situation where the Chinese <coughs> Communist Party would think that the US is supporting it. I mean, after all, they say, well, no, the Americans supported uh, jihadists against the Soviets, the United States wants to undermine China, they must be doing it. And you can never disprove this sort of thing. I mean, the US would say, well, look, we're not doing it. Well, how do we know you're telling us the truth? So you see it then from the, the, the ch something, a conflict with regards to maybe extremist Islam within China, and in, in, in China perceiving that to be back in America. You don't see it in any way with China influencing or playing a role working with jihadists, for, for example, in Afghanistan or Pakistan, and that becoming the proxy, the catalyst for conflict. What do you mean against the United States? Yes. Well, you can see that. I think that's pretty unlikely at this day. And with that, I think, if were this to happen, this would, I mean, that's a possibility. That would, of course, increase tension with, with the U.S. Uh, so you can see it both ways. I mean, you're right. I mean, there's always an unlimited number of conflicts where you start thinking about them. But that's not the one I was thinking of, but thank you for adding it to the list.
You haven't said anything about population per se. Uh, just take Japan and the Soviet uh, and the Russians together. They, at the time when the Russians reached 100 million people, the Japanese will also have 100 million people. For Japan, that is equivalent to the year 1967, the year that they had pushers pushing people on to the Yamate line trains to get them into the moving trains. Russia, uh, going from 140 million to 100 million, uh, distributed 100 million beginning at the Ural Mountains and heading toward the northern uh, islands. You run out of people a long way short of the northern islands. Yeah. And if the Japanese really want to live there, they can just move in the, in the houses that the, the Russians leave to Russia. And China, for instance, this is the first year of the China's population will start going down because of the, the uh, one-child policy. Uh, India will soar beyond China and uh, make them probably the number one economic nation as well as the number one population nation. How does this affect uh, the future of relations more? Well, demography is destiny, as they say. Uh, for every Asian country, so it's a problem from hell. Uh, for Japan, it is, you know, declining, declining labor force. Uh, very difficult to deal with it in the short run because even if fertility increases in Japan, it won't have an impact until 25 years from now when those who are born in this decade uh, join the labor force. And in the short term, actually, when you have an increase in fertility, it increases your costs because you have to educate these kids. Uh, immigration alone cannot compensate for it given the enormous numbers involved. So it's something that all other things being equal will uh, weaken Japan unless there are revolutions in robotics and technology. Uh, which we haven't seen yet. Uh, for South Korea, it will be a problem fairly soon, uh, along the same lines. Uh, for Japan, for China, it will also be an issue with the added twist that because of the sex ratio imbalance, uh, you've had demographers who've argued that there will be a large number of single men who will be at the bottom of the socioeconomic scale because the ones who cannot find wives generally are at the bottom. Uh, they will be unhappy, they will be violent, uh, and what do you do with them? Uh, so it will increase social instability. But even if you don't think that's a problem, uh, obviously in, in China, the combination of a declining labor force at one point with a country that doesn't have a system that is as modern as Japan, both in terms of pensions, health care, and also basic socioeconomic stability, that's very difficult to manage. Uh, India, the fertility has gone down, so that's the way then you get the demographic advantage of having a greater labor, uh, a labor force that will increase without a, lo a large elderly population. Though India in some areas faces a dramatic problem of sex imbalance. I mean, you have schools apparently in some areas of northern India where you have uh, two boys and one, on average of two boys and one girl. Um, how this plays into, into the politics, the stability of a country, we don't really know because we don't have that many uh, historical examples. Uh, so all the, the demography, and, and for Russia, obviously, it, well, Russia is unique in that it's partially developed. I mean, it has middle income GDP per capita, but it has the life expectancy of a third world country uh, for men. Um, Russian women tend to live fairly long because they don't seem to like vodka as much as men. But the combination of vodka, of a bad diet, and of a medical system that's not very effective uh, means I think that Russian men on average don't reach age 60. I think Russia is below Bangladesh now for male life expectancy uh, and more or less at the same level of Cambodia, which is interesting because in some areas, you know, if you look at software, if you look at theoretical physics, Russia is one of the top players in the world. Uh, so you have this combination, you know, I mean, NASA has to rent space on Russian rockets to reach the space station you know, from a country that has a male life expectancy that's similar to that of Cambodia. <laughs> and that is, in, that is Russia's, what makes Russia so interesting, uh, and that there's this <laughs> diversity of outcomes uh, between high performance and not that high performance. Uh, and that's and that's Russia's problem. So they, they all, demography is bad in most of these countries. How does it affect their relative strengths? 
it's hard to say. Uh, it's positive for the U.S. if you look in terms of balance of power, because the U.S. doesn't have this demographic problem. I mean, the U.S. has, by developed country standards, a very young population, one that's still growing, uh, both because of uh, U.S. fertility is very high by the standards of rich countries, and the U.S. also has significant levels of immigration. Um, so that's all that we can say about demography. Okay, so I'm sure uh, there are still uh, more questions, but the time is up, I'm afraid. But I'm sure that Robert can stay for another 10 to 10 minutes, so please ask Robert me. lives at Temple University. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.